Podcast. Welcome to the Almost Perfect Podcast, a celebration of fuck-ups, failures, and falling flat on your face. This is a podcast that believes you can learn from experience, but that experience doesn't have to be your own. Ha, I'm Bob Perfect and I'm a functional fuck-up. Let's learn from somebody else's mistakes. And today we are learning from Neil Green. Now, Neil is a comedian, although he's also been a radio DJ, a writer. He's been in front of the camera a bit. But yeah, man, he was a member of his community here in Durban whilst he was on East Coast Radio. And then he had to give it all up. Well, he didn't have to, but he chose to because his wife got a great job in Ireland. And yeah, they decided that for their family, that would be the best choice. Although for Neil's comedy career, it definitely puts a a bit of a spanner in the works. So we chat about that. Uh, We chat about moving to fucking Ireland and the differences and similarities between South Africa and Ireland. We get into a whole bunch of stuff, man. But of course, I need to let you know that this podcast is brought to you by you, which means you can support it by going to patreon.com forward slash almost perfect. And with that out the way, it's time for the Almost Perfect Podcast with Neil Green. So how are you living, Neil? Oh, I'm living, I'm living good. Yeah, it's, I'm living complicated, I'm living exciting, I'm living on the edge. But overall, I'm living good. Like, I'm happy. That's, yeah, that's quite a quite an interesting way to live. Uh, what's changed since we last spoke on this podcast? You, I don't think we have time for that, so I'll We've give you at least uh, an hour. A, a recap. Oh, <laughs> exactly. Previously on, all right, let me tell you what happened. I moved to a whole other country. That would be the, the big thing. Okay, fair enough. I, I moved... Yeah, I moved hemispheres. So everything really that's changed has, has been around that. So it's actually quite a simple one. I moved to Ireland. That's the big difference. And what, what inspired this change? My wife got a job in Ireland. And I came with her because we just, well, we had a discussion. We said, like, would it be nice to maybe give our daughters a different jumping off point in life? Yeah. You know, and, and I'm one of those people, Bob, like I listen to you enough to know that I wouldn't say that you're super negative about South Africa. In fact, I'd say the opposite. I'd, I'd say that of the people that I know, like you love South Africa, you're in the top percentile of people that love South <laughs> sure. Africa, but you also like a lot of people. <laughs> like a lot of people, you f- you frustrated with what happened. Yeah. Here, but I can't say my move was like, I didn't, I didn't move like the way a farmer would move. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> what to like more fertile ground. The, yeah. You know, like it wasn't this thing where I'm like, I wasn't like in one of these Facebook groups where they were like, oh, the country's gone to hell and you need to move. Like, that wasn't why I moved at all. I just moved because, I don't know, I've lived in the same place my whole life and I just wanted to see if my daughters could get an advantage by starting off differently, you know, than I did. That's fair. And then also your wife had, like, a great opportunity. But that meant you giving up, like, an entire career in some ways because, like, here in South Africa, you were on East Coast Radio, you know, which is one of the biggest radio stations in the country. And you had just released, like, a special on Showmax that's been on TV. And, like, yeah, things here were, seemed like they were going pretty well for you. So that's a pretty big, like, sacrifice to make. Or did you not see it that way? Or what's, yeah, what were your thoughts of all of that? Uh, I mean, Bobby, you just described everything that was, that was wrong with it for me. Like I left at the time when I was not at the top, but like I could see it, like I could see the top, you know what I'm saying? Like everything that I had imagined and dreamed of. And we had like, I was, can I say this? Can I, I mean, there's no point in saying it differently. So I'll say what it was. Like, I even felt like I became like a person in my community. Sure. Yeah. Like definitely, you know, like I'll be honest with you. Like when I was growing up, we had, Neville Pillay and we had Trevor Williams and we had all these people, Ismail Abrams, that were iconic to us because just in the radio space specifically. And like I had become one of those guys, right? And like it, be- it was incredibly hard to tear myself away from them. Like it, it hurts and it still hurts. And then on comedy side, you know, I'm the comedy man. Like I've been, I'm passionate about the craft, about every aspect of it. I've loved it from the beginning and I'm, I'm happy that I was involved in the Durban scene. You know, we came we came up in a Durban scene, you and I, Bob. 
And like your first in- episodes of this podcast was speaking to people like, you know, Carvin. Remember the Carvin, your, your Carvin podcast yeah. remains one of the most like difficult things for me to listen to in terms of just reliving everything that happened there at that time. Yeah, because you had an afro at that do, time. Do you have... and yeah, that was just such a bad choice. <laughs> I, I get it. <laughs> dreadlocks. Uh, dreadlocks, oh, actually. Was, was that the dreadlocks time? Okay. <laughs> there was dreadlocks phase, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm very proud of everything that I achieved in South African well, comedy in, in the scene in people general. People don't necessarily understand. Like, let's actually take a step all the way back to then it's like we created the yeah. scene <laughs> like i was a bit later to the game than you but guys but like i had like my own contributions and yeah we genuinely just you know playing you carbon. i wouldn't say you like, i wouldn't say you were later i was a little bit later than you guys i wouldn't say you, you guys were later. well that's the thing i you guys were established comedians for like a year or two at least by the time i came in like I remember like joining at the Winston, I saw a gig and like everyone was like, Oh, I can sure. do this. You know, <laughs> Glenn Boy was running it at the time. And I think, yeah, like there had been some <laughs> there been some bad comedy and I was like, you know what? Like I, I can go I can at least be better than I can do this. <laughs> Which is the standard way anyone like kinda I think gets the idea that they can start comedy. But yeah, we like literally and like you, and like Carvin especially, created careers from, you know, fucking... Richelieu. Richelieu especially. especially as well. Yeah, yeah Richelieu. Richelieu bounced. Robbie. <laughs> that's the same. But, but that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't think there's dubs, or I don't think there's a timeline on who was involved in creating the scene. I think we can take anyone. We can take Kurt Wilson and say that he played a part in creating Definitely. the scene. Well, it's, not like a, it's not a linear things. thing. Yeah, it's not a linear thing. It didn't start at a point and then it is where it is now. You're like everybody along the way. I would say one of the people that was most influential for me was, wasn't was always like the people on stage. Like, um, and even people that, you know, Vanessa Morton? Yes. Bro, like that, she was so incredibly uh, important in changing the way we saw certain things. Like literally there was one or com- remember the comedy WhatsApp group? Oh my yeah. god! I wish we could play that. That would be an amazing podcast. Oh, like, like it's so funny because like I started like the underground comedy group and I left that thing without saying a single yeah. word. And like, yo, that, that was <laughs> a yo. People need to talk about how toxic WhatsApp groups are. Even if everybody's nice inside it, how does that happen? <laughs> like, everybody inside it is a nice person, and it led. That group led to so much angst and Crabs in a bucket, like, dog. Oh, like that's oh also God. a thing. It's because Durban comedy is still so small and always like well, it won't always be, I don't think, but like, you know, it's definitely the third biggest, you know, comedy scene in South Africa. And yeah, people yeah. don't travel enough as well, like I think. Like a lot of the comedians don't necessarily try to do gigs in Joburg and Cape Town and like actually, you know, move around a bit. So they get anxious about sure. their place in the scene here. And then also just, yeah, like see everyone as competition and all of that. I think like, I think there's just some unhealthy competitiveness. Like I had unhealthy competitiveness and unhealthy vibes for a while. And like, I'm glad like I left that group yeah. and I'm glad you know, like to a degree that, you know, COVID gave me a lot of time off and like a lot of space from a scene or situations that I definitely found, you know, to be unhealthy for me. But you say that, but like, for example, to go back to what I was saying, Vanessa once, I'll never forget it. She started a conversation one day that changed the way we do comedy in Durban forever. (laughs) Honestly, she started a conversation that changed what we deemed acceptable to be on stage like I, I remember having a um, having a phone call with another comedian in the background. I'll tell you this, subtle. Remember <laughs> my guy subtle, who's so important to the scene now yep. in Durban. I remember him and I having a personal conversation off the back of that WhatsApp conversation about uh, what we can and cannot say on stage for the better. Yeah, definitely. I'm glad. Well, so, well that is the the thing about things not just being a boys' club is that yeah, you get right. That. So that's what I'm saying. 
So I'm saying she's as important in set. And that's what I'm saying. Like for me, everything's important in setting up the scene the way it was. I'm happy that I was involved in it. You mentioned the Winston. The Winston was amazing. Um, the Winston was such a big part in our comedy scene, boss. How, how many people did their first gig at the Winston? Yeah, a lot. For that example, was, that was like we just plan, happened. you know, was just that's yeah, why like and, I made it you know, a weekly thing. Kind of, like was I went to. Because other people before me had done gigs at the Winston and it had been a monthly thing, basically. But seeing how Kitchener's had helped the comedians in Joburg just get good and like what a rad room it was and what a cool student space it was. And just like, I've had like right. literally to this day, one of the best sets of my fucking life at Kitchener's on a night where everyone was dying, you know? So like that just made me want to recreate something like that in Durban. And so that was why like I was like, yo, let's do a weekly thing and let's push, you know, new acts on that. And I think it like definitely was a cool catalyst for, you know, the current like you know, crop to a degree, which was really rad. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And then you said Glen Bow, Glen Bow's room at Thunder Rock Cafe. <laughs> and like that's what I'm saying. We can we can go over this, but like the history of comedy in Durban you know, and I had to leave all that. Yes. Like I had, I was so Thanks invested in back it. On track, I still right? am. No, no, not once. Cause like, I'm still like, I can't wait to come back and hop on a stage and that's always going to feel like home. But yeah, I left, I left everything and I started from the beginning and I started working in a petrol station as like an attendant and just really, really just looking up to everything. And it's been, it's been good. <laughs> like, I'm not saying it's been bad. There's it's been bad parts to it. But, yeah, it's been a, a big reconfiguration of the way I think and the way I see the world and, you know. Well, that's interesting because, like, I've always known you as someone who understands, like, you know, working class life. Like, you know, you've always understood that, yo, if sure, I need to put sure. money on the fucking, you know, if I need to put food on the table, if I need to make some money, you know, I will yeah. go and do a fucking hard labor job. Like that's not <laughs> the end of the world to you, Bob. <laughs> Bob, at the at, at at the I won't say at the height, but like at the beginning of my East Coast radio fame, like when I first became known as the guy from like I was DJing. You know, like comedy, I, I always was known. If you came to comedy shows, you knew who I was. Yeah. But now, when you're on radio, people start recognizing you that don't know anything about the arts or comedy or any of that kind of thing, sure. you know? And when I was big, when I took over from, when I first started filling in for Tumblr, where to? So like weekdays it's at six o'clock. Oh, the six o'clock show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. East Coast Urban. You know, when, when. And <laughs> what like, a name. What a fucking name. What a name, buddy. <laughs> we put it on the tin. Like you don't have to worry. It's like, remember a Bacardi Rebel when you used to go to the, the liquor store and they had all the, <laughs> The posh alcohols they had. Oh, they had uh, Smanoff and Absolute and Count Pushkin. And then they had the Picardi Rebel one that just said in big bottles on the bottle, vodka. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we were doing at that time. East Coast like Urban. To... But I just <laughs> Everything like, you need like, to know. But like just in typical East Coast radio fashion, <laughs> they named it like after a 90s thing. You know? <laughs> like It's like... And the but that's the power of these goals. Yeah. Anyway, that's the power of them, and and that's why I will. For, I'm always jumping in random East Coast radio fan page conversations, defending them. I don't mean I don't have to now. I'm like defending them against regular people. But honestly, <laughs> as I'm saying, that was a a big part of of you of course, know, me. It was a big step up for your fame absolutely. levels, and then also for your expression for. Like it gave you a cool avenue, and I definitely saw the impact it had on you. But I also know that yeah, just before yeah. that, you had been working, you know, like no, working class job. Not just before that, during that, that's what I'm saying. At, yes, that's what you're going to bring. The height of my fame, like at, not the height, but I'm saying like at eighty percent of all the fame I was ever going to get, I was having trouble at home, and I had to go work in an oil refinery yep. as the lowest level employee in an oil refinery. I was taking a bus at 4.15 a.m. every morning to go work a 12-hour shift with, and, like, literally be working alongside people. And they go, hey, aren't you the guy? <laughs> like, standing in the canteen waiting to get a subsidized meal. And the guy turns to me, he's like, hey, aren't you from East Coast Radio? And I'm like, he's like, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> I, 
I say I've that conversation twice a week. Yeah, I mean, people don't necessarily understand that, like, the big contracts only come like five to ten years into your radio career. Like, you know, you're like, know. depending. Depending. I mean, I wouldn't say that. I would say I was f- very well remunerated, and that okay. soon passed. As soon, you know, as soon as things kicked off for me, like I was, I'm not complaining. I was fine. But again, I was fine for like a year, and then in that year. Literally, again, when everything was taking off, I had to tell him, all right, guys, I'm out. I'm moving to another country. Thank you for everything you've done for me. Oh, is that true? Yeah. I know you're trying to give me more status and more money and all, but that's fine. You can keep it. I'm, I'm going to go clean urine off ATM machines at <laughs> two o'clock in the morning. <laughs> if that's okay with everybody. <laughs> <sighs> like, I, yeah, I remember us having some of these chats beforehand. I didn't know, you know, you'd land up working at a petrol station, but like, you know, like I know that you're not someone who would look down on that or like, you know, think it's nope. beneath you. So like, yeah. And that's been the biggest part of this part. I mean, I'm no more working there now. Um, I work as can I tell you you're interviewing me? I work as like a quasi receptionist slash security guard slash handyman now. <laughs> it's it's like a, a, a black <laughs> it's like a black sitcom from the eighties, like good times. Yeah, or... <laughs> that's what I was thinking. Like you're just like, you know, yeah, you're that guy. Like oh my god, that's I'm the super. Yeah, yeah, you're the super you know, like, yeah. Fuck. yeah, the slightly Amazing. overweight middle aged guy that they phone for comic relief in the middle, like when everything's going on. They're like, Oh, who put out the fires? Call old Neil. Yeah, like that's me now. Yeah, like a uh, but, that, what was that Bill Cosby um, show, the cartoon? Yo, you just threw Bill Cosby out casually like that. <laughs> We're doing that now. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, Bill Cosby. Uh, there <laughs> was a, anyway, there was a cartoon Cosby. like with the with all the kids that live in the projects. I don't know if you remember. Anyway, I think I think there was, was lots of those shows. Fat yeah, Alberts and Fat Albert was, yeah, was in, one. Yeah. That I'm yeah, the guy was, now in Fat Albert, like where they go, oh, something's broken. We need to go call the uncle. I'm the uncle. Yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> literally, it's literally my job, <laughs> and and I love it. I, I do. I behave like that guy. People will come. Hey, Neil, can you help us? There's been a, a leak on floor four. And I'm like, ah, I'm watching my program when I <laughs> when I'm finished watching this. Like, yeah. So I do that now, and I love it. But that's been a big part about coming to this country is realizing. Like just how well, yeah, if you're working, you're working. There's no, I'm not saying there's no classism. I'm not saying there's no hierarchical structures. Don't get me wrong. That It's not sure. utopia, right? But, and I want people to look at themselves. If you work in a place, and I'm not talking about you specific. How many, how many like regular jobs have you had, Bob? I know you worked in a skate shop. Oh, I've done, time. I did retail like a bunch in like my youth. Ooh. And then I waited. What's the biggest retail situation? The- What's the biggest retail store you were in? Uh no 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 big ones thank fuck but like I've definitely okay. like I've waited like and bartended at some strange places some interesting places some places where people stand outside with AK forty sevens because they want to talk to right. someone outside like yeah <laughs> I've, I've worked some interesting jobs like before I learned that hey the computers may be a better way to make money you there you go and you and you you moved in that direction that's what we do we just yeah. We find a way that we think is a better way and we head that way, you know? But in your journeys in South Africa, you didn't come across this. And your podcast listeners will know that in most office situations, hospital situations, I've worked in so many different industries now, right? There's such a big difference between the person that, not even the CEO, I'm saying like upper management and the, the cleaner, to use the term, Right. Those two people are separated by so much in the workplace, you know, and I'm not saying it's super negative. I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm not saying that person's having a hard day. (laughs) Yeah, but there's a big distinction between how they, I mean, we all eat lunch in the same place and everything, but there's such a big distinction between how you viewed, depending on where you are in the company's organogram. Exactly. I think that, yeah, whether you're in a call center, whatever situation that you're in, there's always somebody you can look down on. I'm not saying the tea lady is like uh, like you know prime example. Yeah, but I used to work. In, I worked in a in a call center in Pine Town, and there was a lady who was literally a tea lady. In like 2008, there was somebody whose job it was to ask you how many sugars and come there and bring you. You know, and I'm not going to be that person because I know I'm part of the problem. I'm part of the problem. 
I've also lived in in those worlds. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, we all but, have. Like that's why, yeah, I bring it up. It's but yeah. even with even within that world, like I hated looking up and seeing a person like much younger than that person being rude to them for fuck all oh, reason. Fucking one hundred percent, dude. <laughs> like, oh. You get what I'm saying? And that happens, yeah. and we can't act like that doesn't happen. And that's that's the big lesson that if I could transplant from where I am now to South Africa, yeah, in Ireland, if you're working, you work. Like you're a worker, you're working the same as everybody else. And there's virtually no difference in the way you treated, the way you considered, the way you spoken to in the workplace. Like in, in that way. Everybody's yeah, we all work in the, the same worst place. white people were like shipped off to South Africa and they like, you know, created the hierarchical <laughs> structures. Like it's like <laughs> islands like, you know, it also got like some of the rather white people, like as history would, you know, like they fought against oppression. They fought against like a lot of shit, you know, like with regards yes. to the English and that. Like, so and they didn't they, just fight against it. Like, from my like, understanding of like life in Ireland, I mean, I obviously don't actually know the reality, but like, yeah, like I, I understand them to be a fairly like pro working class yes. society. Oh, absolutely. If if you're contributing in that way, you are valued. They have their own problems. For some reason, they don't like Romanian people. I didn't realize there was so much inter-white racism until I got here, cuz. Like, it's fucking weird. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Europe, you know, like, who do, who do you think they hated first? Like, I mean, other okay. white people. I couldn't believe that. Like, you know, and in, in Ireland, Ireland is one of the, am, am I correct in saying they're one of the few white countries that was colonized? They, they they would be the only ones, right? Can you think of another one? Um, I, I th- can't. No, like I think well, it depends on how you view history, but like in terms of modern history, yes. Like in terms yeah, of ancient sure. history, like colonization was oh, the, oh, yes. the game. I know the Austro Austro Hungarians like, were put to work in them. I mean, I'm I talking about just Rome, you know. <laughs> like I'm talking about yeah. like just. The, like yeah, like this- the, and ju- you know the old Germanic tribes. Like there's been like conquest and you know even the English and the fucking French and whatever. But like yeah, in terms of modern but in this history, season of history, yeah, yeah, in, in season so, four of history, in, in terms yeah, like, of the period where England was you know colonizing black people, yeah, like Ireland yes, yeah. were the it's weird that they picked the Ireland. <laughs> so so yes, there's been a lot of carryover for that, and they they have a lot of pride in the fact that they've overcome that, and again. They haven't fully overcome that. And a lot of the biggest changes took place recently, like in the early 90s. Yeah. You know, it's, yes. it's, not, it's not been. Yeah, so the troubles yes, were the I, 80s. So, like. You see? So that's what I'm saying. So, I, I yes, I think a lot of it. And they're proud of that. Did you know how proud they are of the, the part that they played in ending apartheid? Like, they yeah. throw that up, buddy. Yeah, they wear it on their shoulder. They're very pro Palestine. I know, because they were an oppressed people. Like, it's. Yes. Yeah. It, and it's sad that South Africa doesn't necessarily have the same camaraderie because, like, yeah, capitalism and whiteness, I guess, is the easiest way to describe it, has taken yeah. root, like, you know, even amongst non white people. And, like, yeah, it's. We're not as proud of our history of overcoming, you know, oppression, I guess. It's it's strange because I guess yeah, yes. like our government's corrupt and all of that. So oh, oh, oh. that that oh, makes God. things a little tricky. <laughs> and we used to have those conversations. I remember you and I I'll be talking yeah in front of your podcast members. So we once <laughs> sure. recorded a podcast, a heated podcast. That was centered around, or I can say what it was about, about farm murders. And we never ended up putting that episode out. And I remember how, like how shouty it was. Like we were both <laughs> upset about so many things and upset. It was in the height of that time when they were doing that march, you know? And that's the thing. There's so many times where I'm agreeing with people, but I'm also be feeling other sided in it. South Africa well, has a lot of other sidedness. Yeah, because yeah. that's the thing. Like, it's like it's the whole DA problem. It's like, yeah, you're right, but like, we can't vote for you. Like, we know yeah, you're... because you've created a side. <laughs> like, we're not looking for a side. We're looking for unity. You know. Yeah, we, and then it's so mad. That's that's actually a great fucking way to describe it. Yeah, that, that's the problem, and then that frustrates me because on the other side, I look across and I see people like you know we always talk about Nicole Graham and Christopher Pappas and people <laughs> that have been so like dedicated in their work to sorting things out. And it's like, but, but at the same time, you are on the other side. Yeah. So 
Yeah, also, well, I mean, I wanna... we, yeah, that's the funniest thing is we've had like DA politicians watch us do comedy at the Winston. <laughs> yeah, and enjoy it and be and and people that are progressive and embody everything that I would want in in a leader at every level throughout the organization. Yeah, you know? but then you look like, you know, in Bali left, like in, you know, Musi left. And that's it's... Then you start yeah. asking yourself what's what's going on there. But yeah. So, but just to put a bow on that, uh, there are actually also knobs in Ireland, like they are anyway. It, it just oh, it obviously. seems to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Jordan Peterson was here recently and sold out the big three arena. So there's obviously a market for that kind of thing as well. So I'm not going to say it's all good. I can see in my understanding of Irish media well irish culture through media that there might be yeah. a bit of a masculine you know undertone to some things and also like in terms of people like because i know like ireland had like the the what was it like the paper tiger years or like where oh, the celtic was, celtic tiger years yes that was it yes yeah so it's amazing then, like, a lot of people have been living like in the residual of that and like you know so things there you know, they've gone through like a big boon and then like a big crash as well. So there's yes. maybe with the some biggest people. Yeah. The biggest like boon of, and the biggest crash. Yeah. So they might <laughs> yes. have a lack of direction. And so someone like Jordan Peterson might be, you know, something that they, they're they attracted to. Hmm. But let's leave him alone. And let's, can, I want to talk about comedy in Ireland because you said. Yes. You said, well, that's what I did eventually want to get to. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because when you when you said Celtic Tiger, you made me realize like like a lot of the comedy still senses around that, you know. Oh, is it? Well, because it's obviously it's, uh, people like in their late thirties, early forties. That absolutely, comedy, that's and that's what, yo, you know, that's that's such a difference. Like, I don't know. I'm not saying it's definitive, but I'm saying from what I've, I've observed here, it's like the age of a comedian seems to matter less here. I'm not saying age matters a lot, but when you look at somebody on, in a global perspective, right? When you look at somebody like, um, who can I say? Cat Williams. Like as Cat Williams is aged, he's had to change what it is that he does so much because he doesn't fit into. Yeah, he's become ungodly. It's interesting. <laughs> I don't know if he ever wasn't, hey? Is it okay? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm, I don't remember that part of his work because I just always connect with the weed stuff. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but okay. Let me start here. Yeah. Dave Chappelle was in Ireland. Dave Chappelle was in Ireland about a month ago or a little bit longer than that ago. And I remember my wife was so excited when the tickets went on sale. She was like, I'm getting us tickets for Dave Chappelle. And I was, I was like, please don't. And she was like, what, <laughs> wow. she's like, what do you mean? I was like, I'm not going to see Chappelle now. So we started having this conversation and it's like, I don't care as much about some of the noise around it. But what sure. I care about is is that it's just not funny anymore. Like, like you've Thank seemed you. to have yeah, attached that's yourself. Yeah, part of it, yes. Yeah, boss. You've attached yourself to a single issue and have defended your position on this single issue so much Three that it's consumed so much. For like $60 million. <laughs> yeah, what, what are we doing? Like, that's fucking weird. That feels like bigotry. Yeah, it's uh, weird. It's it's also, you- like, it just reminds me of like when Eminem came to South Africa and like I didn't go because mm-hmm. it was just like... Yeah, like if this was maybe, you know, earlier, I would have been <laughs> yeah. like there. But like, yeah, at this point, I was like, I don't want to see a 40-year-old man like rap about like his like father issues. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's exactly what it is. Like, we do that with c- comedy as well, like on, on in a global, on a, in a global scale. We kind of do that with comedy, like you, you lose know. touch. Like good with, comedians like everybody. get better as they get older. Like I've always felt that way. Like Mark Lutzing, Mark Lutzing, absolutely. Mark Lutzing in South Africa for sure. But he's also one of the Mark few Lutzing. older comedians. And so when you brought that up, one of the things I wanted yeah. to bring up is because of apartheid. Like the only like older older comedians are like a handful of people who survived. Like that aren't white, and then are the white guys who, you know, like started clubs. Got a baked in audience. Yeah, they'll yeah, never yeah. not have an audience. It doesn't sure. matter what they do. They'll always have 500 people to buy a ticket from them in certain cities. But at the same the time, like for comedians and for comedy, they're not exactly like, you know, shining lights or prime examples. Oh, no. So, you know, that's the thing. Like we haven't got older comedians necessarily, unless you're talking about like your Mark Lutterings, 
and like no, um, I wouldn't group your Peter, Peter Dirk Ace depending on how you want to view him. Like, can can I say Barry Hilton? Can I say you can Hilton? say it, but you like, can you tell the story you wanted to tell me on this podcast because you mentioned you had a Barry Hilton story, <laughs> and I don't know if it's a full public consumption story or not. <laughs> I mean, I don't care. Yeah, it's for, I'm, I don't care. <laughs> That's the thing. I'm I'm not invested. Like, I don't think anybody should be above. Like, I know I'm not being discussed. So, I mean, <laughs> I, I was I was having a conversation with myself, and I saw Barry Hilton was coming to perform here because now I'm in another country. Uh, I'm over forty. I've been doing comedy for seventeen years. I'm starting to have this feeling in myself that I don't know. Like kind of like I've left the success behind me, like Ooh. the success I had I had in South Africa, and I don't know if I'm motivated enough to be an open spot door stepping people here and asking for five. When minutes. was this? Because okay, so before we get into this Barry Hilton story, let's yeah. talk about that for a second, then we'll get into it. Because yeah, like when we were chatting last year, you were saying it was yeah. difficult for you to even get open mic slots. Absolutely. I had to be so aggressive about it. I had to be well, the like worst you were, of the guys. literally got like a recorded special. You know, like how like everyone has like a recorded special on TV. No, not everyone has a fucking recorded special on TV. <laughs> so why can't you just give me five fucking minutes, dickhead? Like you don't have any yeah. conversations like that. Okay, but that's exactly how, that's how I feel all the time. If, if that makes sense. Yeah. No, that's just, I generally walk around like that all the time. Like you guys weren't there. You don't know what I've been through. You yeah. went in the Royal Palm Hotel the night we performed to six people, me and Masood, and people were throwing buffet <laughs> items at us. You were not there. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, we performed to two people at the Winston. Like, yeah. you know, you know, you weren't there the day that the the guy threw a Heineken bottle at Dusty Rich. In oh, you know, you weren't there the day yeah. Bob literally got times. crucified. <laughs> yes. Oh you, yeah. So this is Sunday. <laughs> You didn't have to jump in the in the back seats of a car and cover yourself with a jacket at green sleeves in Hillcrest so the angry mob couldn't see you leaving the place, you know? <laughs> and, you know? <laughs> and now now I have to prove, all right, send me a clip of yourself. I'm like, send you a fucking clip. <laughs> what do you mean send you a clip, buddy? <laughs> you know, so yes, there's a lot of that underneath. Like I feel that underneath. But at the same time, Bob, if I'm honest with myself, I've done a 80 minute special. It is one of the things I'm the most proudest of in the world. You should you go should watch it if, if it's still on, on Showmax. But of that 80 minutes, how much of that is transplantable uh, in, in Ireland? And that's the question you start asking yourself. Like I've seen a lot of, you see, I've seen a lot of uh, acts go overseas. I got Luis Ogola right here up the road, you know, who is, I mean, this man just pops up on, 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 Paul Chowdhury's podcast that it has this thing. And I was like, oh, Lisa Gold has got an episode. And then I'm watching TV. I'm yeah, like, that's a game show. Oh. It's also kind of yeah, he's... this podcast before. So if anyone wants to listen to that, go look him up. Oh, yeah. What a crazy episode as well. But I'm saying like, I'm, but Bob, like that's, I'm expecting that. Like that's within the fraternity of what we do, you know? Yes. But I'm talking about, I'm, I'm watching regular Tuesday night TV but he while I'm eating. also like shift his style for overseas and like, like you yes. know, he's that's the thing. Like he's like he ate shit for years in fucking England. Like you listen to him talk, he'll tell you like it wasn't fucking easy for him to just go over there and just be Lisa Gola. Like and that's that's where I am now with two big differences. Number one, he's younger than me to start off with, and mm -hmm. he started this process younger than me. Yeah, and with a lot if more I'm honest. Him. If I'm honest, he's better than me. Like, so I'm I'm behind by quite a few categories here. You guys you know? are different. Like, I wouldn't necessarily like. He's also had more big room experience and shit like that. But like, oh, I mean, I. But I mean, even if know, I just... like, yeah, like personally, like you know, you are one of my favorites. Like, just genuinely, like. No, and no, thank you for that. Smart, but I'm, but like, I'm being, I'm not in this category. I mean, I've watched this man through. Pure yeah. Manati, late, late, like sketch comedy, movies. That's like, also the like, thing, like, we've seen, like, I mean, I watched those dudes on fucking the PMS show, like, on fucking... Yes. Late Night yeah, News. Like, yeah, Late Night News, all of it. And, like, yeah, it's been fucking crazy seeing, like, the hearts and getting to talk to people and getting to, like, yeah, it's been sure. fucking cool. So, but, like, yeah, a lot of them have gone overseas to do it. 
And that's what I'm saying. Like, and they came at the time with the fire in their belly and the surety of themselves. And as you're saying, even with that, I'm sure Would there was you? moments that it felt like a misstep and there's times when you feel down about it. But it's like, I'm nowhere near that. And it's so hard for me to get motivated to go eat shit. But he like, wasn't don't anywhere like near he... that without all the club gigs, like in fucking London. <laughs> Without the eating shit yes. of the Apollo, without well, he didn't eat shit, but like he took years oh, to get he to the Apollo. Apollo. Oh, yeah, God. but he but like, what... he ate shit to get to the Apollo was the story because like but yeah, that's that, what but... I'm saying. Like, yeah, I don't know if I'm down for the journey. You know, that's oh, where I find your myself. Family like, right now, like who's yeah, like <laughs> and, and I'm an excellent laugh. And I'm an excellent. I'm climbing up the ladder of receptionist slash security guard. <laughs> One so day fast, the, 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 the building. You know, it's soon I'm gonna have those keys on my belt and all that. There, you know. <laughs> so, so I'm saying it's it's hard to pick myself up when it does go badly. And it, I'm not gonna lie, it's not all going badly. It's been going very well at times. I've been here on the scene. I've, I've been finding spaces. Yeah, I've been but what Instagram posts? I've been seeing people in the crowd yeah, that you've been reposting. You see, like that's the thing, like. I'm still at that level where I'm going to get people to take photos for me. You have people just naturally doing it. Oh, my, my, my G, honestly, there's people that come up to me and say, I love that. Can I buy you a drink? The one guy's like, yo, we need to get you over. There's a club in Birmingham. Like, you know, it's, I was supposed, I got booked for the Edinburgh Fringe. I was only here for a couple what? of months. And it's, a guy saw me. Sick. Yeah, I got booked for the Irish. There's a show, a Irish, a specifically Irish show that they do at the Edinburgh Fringe. And the guy that books, it's called the All Island. Wait, show. you did and that the already because the print just happened. No, I didn't go. I couldn't get a visa in time. I can't oh, go to the UK, remember? Fuck. Shit. Yeah, the guy booked me. I still got the booking forms here, bro. Like, you know how that broke me to, to make it into a show of that caliber after only starting for like two months. The guy literally was there. He was geeking and he saw me. And I was like, what the fuck, buddy? Does Britain you need have to be gay? on this show. Does Britain have gay marriage? Yes. Okay, because then I can just finish sorting out my British passport and you know, I just need to get married. It's like... A- Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. I'm, I'm even down to make it look real. Whatever we need to do to make it look real. <laughs> <laughs> an only fan but- will be sick. Um- <laughs> a portfolio of evidence. So yeah, you were talking about like, you know, starting again in Ireland and it's been going well. You've been booked for Edinburgh, but like... We chatted last week and you were talking to me. We had like a great chat before you were going to a gig. And like, I was like, don't be cuck, which is, you know, like the South African oh, motto. Man. It's our, it's our break a leg, you know? Sure. <laughs> and I was so cucked that night. Oh my God. I was, that was like, that was the, I think the worst gig, one of the worst gigs, definitely top three that I've done in Ireland, maybe in my life. And to the, it was so bad to the point that like a young comedian pulled me to the side after and they're like, oh man, you know, I like your style, but maybe you can work on this, you know, maybe when you, maybe when you do, uh, I love maybe it. when you do that joke instead of that punchline, which didn't work by the way, maybe, instead of that, you know, uh, maybe you can attack it from this angle. And it is, I don't know, in a way I understand that. And I like that, that. <laughs> There's a lot of no. Nah, there's a lot of like people on the scene that genuinely want the scene to be good. Is no we early on in this no, conversation we're rare. talking about. <laughs> no, yeah, like no, there's there's still a, a lot better these days. But yeah, yeah. No, there's still a competitiveness. Don't worry. But it's like, yeah, people understand that the show being good is more important than anything else. Yes, I want to be better than you, but I need the show to be good because I need people to come watch the show again because the scene yeah, at the same time is like very small and massive like they have lots of small gigs and sure uh, there is no central it like sounds great yeah there's lots of small gigs and they pitched so differently and there's such a different feel and a vibe to every room you know so everyone's but, tighter there basically because they get more experience yeah like i, I was talking to a, a guy a really nice guy a name of shane clifford and he came up to me and, you know, he's one of like the top comedians here. And he said, he, he and I did a gig together some time back. And he said, how's it been? Have you been getting stage time? And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm doing like three gigs a month. And his face fell and he was like, oh man, no, you need to. I'm I was sorry, like, bro. is that a little? Like I thought that was plenty. <laughs> you know, like, he, 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 felt, like, yeah, he felt like I was failing, you know, like he wanted to help me. Like, nah, you, I, I can do, I can help you. 
you know? <laughs> and I was like, no, th- three a month is a lot. Not a lot, but three a month is perfectly decent. But that's the thing. He had a guys that are doing three, four a week, every week, you know? Yeah, which was like fucking, like the thing I've spoken about on this podcast a lot, like just my absolute dream, man. Like I just want to even just like for like six months of my life, just experience what it's like to do comedy every night. Like that is definitely before you know the fucking ask us hey, all. Toba goes like, what kind of dream at one stage? I know not anymore. Yeah, they, but was- I mean, they kind of are. So like, there's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Tuesday. There's two gigs. I'm not sure about yeah. the other night, but like, there's also the- Sunday at the Bioscope. So like, yeah, like exactly. there's definitely like I'm personally continually like my plan going forward is just to save up like a couple grand. Cause I found like a nice cheap Airbnb near Melville, so like I can right. stay there the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, and do like four gigs in that time. And like, sure. cause I'm trying Maximize to work out. Yeah, yeah. And, like, I'm just trying to, yeah. So like, yeah, for the gigs I do in Durban and stuff, like if I just save that money that I get paid and like use that to go towards like going to Joburg, and then I can test stuff, and like I can just get like some rapid fire like stuff in, and like just. Yeah, because I'm working towards next year, you know, doing a one man show and all of that. And it's just like, sure, I'm just not going to like, be able to do that by doing a gig a month in Durban, you know? Absolutely not. Even just on an artistic, artistic side, it's better to work. I, even when I was in Durban, I would love going out to Joburg for a week or two because it's, it's very so nice. different. Very different. <laughs> Cape Town, I don't have that same affinity for. Like I, like I was, Cape Town. I, live, I roll with cool people when I go there. So like great people. No, I'm saying yeah. the the comics in Cape Town. Don't get me wrong, are amazing people. But I mean, the first time I did Cape the Cape Town comedy, mixed, like, yeah. <laughs> really? No, I mean mixed as in like some of them are good, some of them are bad. But like Joe Burrow oh, yeah, like, sure. seems to have like but an everywhere. affinity for comedy. You know, like I've never really yeah. had like a shitty room but i could also well actually i did a gig recently i'm not going to mention which one that no one showed up to so uh <laughs> <laughs> like i still got paid so i don't mind but like yeah it was definitely but they like, feel like us that's what i'm saying cape town feels like durban in, in maybe even a bit behind durban not anymore well, I, not anymore i, I mean i haven't been felt a while, before, but like their yeah, their scene COVID. seems to be pretty big and strong at the moment i don't know but that's like from the outside like seems like there's a lot of gigs it seems like there's a lot of people putting in work there so for I sure need to, i need to make my way down there next year it's just fucking flat prices uh and that but no matter how you break it down job looks different and um yeah you, there's you a know, and- fuck yeah there's this yeah like joburg has what you were saying just now like where people just want to get better that's what it seems yeah, like absolutely Absolutely. And like, yeah, in Ireland, it's weird because the scene and I'm, I'm, this is not, again, this is not the last word in it. I'm saying from my experiences here, yeah. I've noticed, I stay in Dublin and I've noticed that in Dublin, the comedy gigs are split between the gigs that make turnover and make money and are in the tourist heavy parts of the city. And when you do that gig, the audience like is, the audience is all people on holiday, boss. Sounds like Cape Town. Yeah, there's virtually no Irish people in in the rooms there. Do you get what I'm saying? So yeah, like you start talking to people. people. Exactly. But this is even on steroids because you've got, on the same night, you've got four comedy clubs all going, all full. And they, I mean, packed to the gills. That sounds a like great experience, dude. It like is. In terms of being like a global comedian. But I'm not trying to be a global comedian. Me personally, like I, again, I, I get that appeal for everybody I mean, else. And I wanna, the guys that I'm friends with. Part of like, the skill set you should learn. Nope. I don't want, I'm not, I've never been, you know me, I've never been interested in that. I just want to have 40 people that anytime I have a show, those 40 people will come watch. That's all I want. Because, yeah, like, what I if you can, like, get more, like, what if you can connect with more people? I don't like, care. You know, like, <laughs> I like, I like doing comedy and I like doing the kind of comedy that I like doing. And for me, the worst feeling, and I mean, I'm saying the worst feeling, but like 70% of comedy is going out in a room and saying, what's going to make these people laugh, you know? But oh, I'm, I'm giving up on that, dude. I don't give a fuck. Like, See? what I've literally been learning to do is just going, well, this is the stuff I want to talk about. Like, how do I make that's it the, funny? That's the this is me and now. Then, you guys yeah. know me. 
you guys understand me, so you're going to go along with me on this, you know? So if I'm yeah. in Ireland and I'm, I'm trying to get into the stand-up comedy scene, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be the Irish version of what I was in Durban, which was that if you bought a ticket to come see a show that I was in, if it wasn't at the ICC and it wasn't like in a big room like that, you knew what you were going to get. And I, I had You're going to get some weird shit. Yeah. And like those Good. people, I'm still in contact with them and I've done their weddings and I've been there. And I know their children. Like it's real people. Like, do you get what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. They're people that have grown up with me in that laughing stock run, especially. But I'm saying that's what I feel like a comedian is. Like, I feel like a comedian is like, like a band that you like, you know, you can listen to other bands, but when you see that the band that you like is putting something else, you know, aha, this is my, it's always been my vibe. I can't wait for the new album from whoever. Yeah, definitely. Like I fully get that. And with comedy, my thing has always been writing. I love writing. And anytime when, you know, like there was a time we were doing like those Florida road shows, you know, when Florida road was popping. And I remember those were the rules. in a different way now, though. Oh, is it? <laughs> but like, you know, like the, the pressure of being good because the guy that owns the club, we just started out here and he, you know, he liked what he saw last time. More of the same. That's very different to what we were doing at the Winston or at Laughing Stock and at Bat Center and all these other places where every time I was out there, I was doing new stuff for better or for yeah. worse, you know. <laughs> but anyway, I, I won't get bogged down in that, but I'll say the Irish comedy scene is very good for that. And I've actually been finding a lot of joy in the outlying areas. Like I've been gigging down in Carlo and Cork and Malingar. Cork and the places that very are- cool from what I understand. Like, so oh, Pedro's uncle is from like Ireland and that. And like, we had like a great yeah. weekend away with them and that. And I like, spoke a bit about Cork. And then like, I listened to this podcast uh, called the Bland Boy Podcast, which a listener of this podcast put me on to. Um, Aaron Peters, shout outs to him. And that's his yeah, podcast. Like, but, what do you mean it's well, his no, podcast? It's not his podcast. He should oh, 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 this is a dad podcast. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Blind Boy podcast is like, yeah, fucking sick. So, and he's from Cork. So, it sounds like a really interesting place and like a cool like, little cultural hub, from what I understand. Absolutely. And that's why I've been, that's why I'm, I'm there next week. I'm there twice in the next couple of weeks and it's farts and the other side of the world. But why I do well there is that it's Irish people and i'm living in ireland now so a lot of the foibles and a lot of the like the stuff that's been assimilated into my comedy my experiences are decidedly irish experiences so that's what my output is so you know and then obviously i've been using that to counteract with how different this experience is versus the same experience in south africa and in durban yeah which is great like it gives you a unique perspective on the scene Yes, and that's that's what's been resonating with the people that like me here. Like, I'm booked for a headline show at the end of the month, and for that person that booked me for that show, that's what they love about me, that I'm giving the immigrants experience, but at the same time, like, I understand Irishness. But now, what's the good of doing it's all that? It's an immigrant's experience from, you know, a country that they like. So. <laughs> yeah, and then what's the good of, of uh, engendering all that and then trying to tell a guy from Norway? Who doesn't understand either end of the the, the references? I'm not saying that. I'm, that's what that's what I mean. Like I, I no see. So I kind of disagree there because I've thought like that a lot in my life. But like, sure. I'm starting to understand that people are deeper than we think, and oh, that no, more no. people oh, can oh, connect sorry, sorry, than Let me be like. I just want to clarify. I just know for myself, like you know, like I've I've always been like oh, you know, these people won't get me and this and that. And mm. what I've realized now is like, mm-hmm. if I just come on stage and like talk to people like they're mm-hmm. going to like me, that they get the jokes. <laughs> like, you know, they're, they're not that clever. Like, no one's that stupid. They just don't like being spoken down to. <laughs> so like, you know, personally, like I've found just, yeah, that that's my journey. That's, no, least. no, but that's what I'm saying. I want to I clean it up. The dream, when you say be a global com- comedian, the dream is to be able to tell their joke so well to a guy that's never been to either country that he gets both sides of it. That's well, exactly. The so, but you can get that skill from working in those clubs for sure. But I don't feel like it's the right. I'm still trying to figure. I'm still trying to be a new comic. I'm still trying to find out. Like I'm still trying okay. to be that side of it yet. And then every time I get put into these rooms, it's. I'm not, not every time. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm doing well there as well, <laughs> but 
Yo, don't just show me a picture. Don't cut yourself any bookings with your honesty. Yeah, you know? that's what I'm saying. Like, no, the bookings are coming. Like, I'm I'm at least that good that I'm not worried about that. Well, all, yeah, all that's not like I was just like as like as soon as someone sees you, like it's not going to be a problem. Yeah. Like you know, like with the and that's what I'm saying. Like, so I'm not complaining, and I'm doing I'm doing the big club, the international. I'm booked there on the 30th of December, so that date is very much circled on on my on my calendar, you know? So that's what I'm saying. Things things are happening for me, Bob, and I'll be at Edinburgh Fringe next year and I'll be doing all those things, but it's, it's, it's dude, humbling, man. Like, it's fucking... It's like, fucking, dude, you know, the Fringe is like, you know, it's the thing, man. Like, it's the, like... like... Yeah, I'm good after that. I mean, after that, what do I have left to do? I mean, there's yeah, lots that, of... That's, that's, that's kind of it for of me. It's like... Shit. I just yeah. want to create a show that's good enough to show at the fringe and like, yeah, <laughs> like that's, yeah, no, like, I don't give a fuck like, about anything like, else in comedy, to be honest. <laughs> like, Whatever happens after that is the chips left in the bowl, you know, like I, I'd, I'd have eaten the burger at that point. Whatever happens <laughs> after that in my life is just the chips left. I'm it's like, it's nice. Coffee. That's enjoyable. Like, you know, chips have spice. I'm happy. Sauce, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, it's like a, but like. You you enjoy, you had the meal that you deserve. Yeah, like, yeah I've like, been taking I'm, bites out of the burger all this time. I've been I've been on TV. I've sold a special. I've done streaming. I've I've written for productions. Like you know, I'm as I said, I'm a Bali now, cause in, in you've been in on one of the fucking biggest radio stations in South Africa in a prime time slot. You know, and I can I be honest with you, I I could go full bears. And I could say, I'm I'm in Ireland now, and I'm doing a show, and all South Africans in Ireland, come see my show. My show was called Liquor Liquor Comedy. And oh, yeah, we didn't talk about the, the Barry Hilton story yet. There you go. <laughs> that's, that's the simplest version of it that I just said to you now. Uh, I'll just book a venue. I could sell. Oh, no, oh it's the Kevin Frazier model. Yeah, I could I could do that. Like oh, uh, some Africans, let's c- come to my show. I'm gonna be yeah. racist for an hour. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Without being without being arrogant, I could literally go, "Oh, it's the Tamaleki and Buravos comedy explosion," and like, do you know, I, I could do that on an Antarctic show. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's like I, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I want to be an Irish comedian. Does that make sense? Like. It um, does, well, like I admire them. Like it, you should, like that. Yeah, I'll always be from Durban. I'll always be South African. I, my my credibility there is it's infallible. But I'm not. I'm trying to be in this scene. I'm not trying to come round up the expats that like that. I don't want to be the Irish guy in Malaga playing traditional Irish music to the Irish people from home and a few locals that like that kind of thing. Yeah. I'm. I want to be part of this scene, and I'm. I'm on my way there. I, I, I may sound a bit tad negative about it, but no, that's my nature. And also, like <laughs> I feel down because the whole move of coming here has been taxing. Like it has been difficult. Well, yeah, the whole pandemic thing obviously didn't help with it either. Yeah, and just like just moving countries, like I don't know, moving house is probably stressful in general. Also just so, like, <laughs> as a family, like that's such a big thing because, oh, like, cool. you know, like it's a conscious choice. It's a choice I'm going to continue to make for as long as I can make it. <laughs> like, you know, sure. to not have kids, and like in my mind, it's always like. Yeah, I can just go do a thing for a while. Like, I can just go to England for six months. Like, you know, that yeah. is, like, my long-term plan for it. But it's like, I don't even want to move to England forever. Like, I just want to go do it for six months. And I can do that. Like, Paige understands, and it's like, no stress. Maybe she'll come with me. Maybe not. Who knows? Because I can do that. You, like, had to do this whole big thing. As, but I like, did it because yeah. of that. I didn't, exactly. I wasn't okay. doing it. And then I had that layer of complication on top of it. Well, that's also that was like, the whole yeah. reason I did it. So, you know. Well, yeah, you gave up fame and fortune in South Africa for yeah. eventual fame and fortune in Ireland. I mean, yeah, touch wood, right? Yeah, four leaf clovers <laughs> and leprechauns and all that, <laughs> all the lucky <laughs> things. Yeah, let's go, lucky charms. <laughs> I'll see how let's it goes. Actually, let's actually talk a little bit about a project you've been working on that I heard recently. And like, hey. it was a thing that was going to be a book and might still be a book, but you've got a yes. new like podcast slash audio project slash, what are you calling this thing? I don't know. It's, it's episodic content in today's climate. It's definitely a podcast. It would be a podcast, but you know that it started off life 
as as a book and then in writing it i realized i'm i'm not that good at writing does that make sense i'm not bad at it but you know bad at it all like you've got uh like it's one of the things my one friend Russell Grant always said about me like you know like you've got a voice like when people read your yes. stuff they can hear you and like i think that's super important like in writing especially in modern writing cuz i think grammar and stuff like that is you know like language is mutable like things change like yes. it's not i, you know, I agree with that. Speak, yeah. i don't feel like i feel like the idea that we need to conform to these archetypical ways of like putting words together i didn't decide that some guy one of van ribeck's friends decided that hundreds of years ago i i didn't agree to all this yeah i mean you guys like shakespeare fine i mean bro shakespeare made up words yeah, bro, but- like literally like shakespeare like cha- like every good writer changed shit to some degree but even him now so I, like yeah i think shakespeare's the most overvalidated guy ever like fine he's done what he's done now bro, i disagree I disagree entirely. How long? <laughs> how long we have to carry on this bitter man? man? Hey man, there's been bitter. There's been bitter people in Shakespeare since then. And yeah, there's been better people than Shakespeare since. Yeah. But like, he's the foundation. It's just like we were talking the, the other day about like he's your foundation. You saying he's a racist. He's your our. My, he is our foundation. No, my foundation like, definitely. Emotep. I agree with you. Know emo tip. Uh, that's my guy. <laughs> I know emo <laughs> tip from the mummy movie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know, but I'm just, but I'm just joking about that. But yeah, so so in that, and no, absolutely. So I just had this thing, and you know how much I love. we did a podcast together for a long time. So you know how passionate I am about music. We did, and I actually like because it ties into what you just said about Shakespeare. Now I feel like Shakespeare is like the Beatles and like Elvis and is Bob Dylan part of the Beatles? Uh, it depends on like who you ask. I'd say no. I'd say he's kind of like in the mythology, yeah. the antithesis. But like the Beatles were like in their own way kind of punk, dude. Oh. They're, like not really. It's it's all complicated. It's all depends on who you ask. It depends on what you talk well, about. Like, points uh, without getting into. Yeah. Like the thing is, like Elvis just stole shit from black people. You right. know, like the Beatles were at least, like even uh, that's what I'm saying. Wild. A bit. Beatles didn't play certain venues because, like, I, I and that's what I'm saying. I'm not trying to shit on anybody. Yeah, yeah, their politics were right from what that's I understand. What I'm so I want to be clear. I'm not shitting on those people. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Nirvana. I talk shit about Nirvana, my new bit. Like, oh, really? but anyway, <laughs> as you're saying. No, but, but that's what I'm trying to say. I, oh, dude, I've hated Nirvana my whole life. Like, it's no, I have, and that's the thing, cause. I don't know any. I don't know what's three doors down. I don't know why you guys hate Lincoln Park as much as you. I don't understand any of it, right? I understand some of it. I used to hate Lincoln Park. I appreciate them a bit more now. Same like with Nirvana. Yeah. I appreciate them a bit more now. Like I, I get it. Like whatever. But like, yeah, I've always just kind of just been like, yeah, like I, you know, like when you grow up, like actually poor, yeah, like rich white people should bugs you sometimes. Okay, so now you're kind of getting into where I'm getting into, right? We've decided that there's all these groups and bands and important people like Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and I don't know them, right? I don't know all of them, but, sure. but we've decided that these are the people that are important musically, and you're not allowed to say anything negative about Queen or whoever <laughs> because they have given birth to so many classic music and moments and everything, and. Yeah, I don't. There's almost like a condescending way that people throw jazz and Motown into that. Like, yes, uh, Bob Marley was fine, and Marvin Gaye was fine, and I feel like we've given enough figureheads that they can go, yes, but Aretha Franklin is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so shut up. And we make T-shirts of Biggie, and we sell them in H and M, so shut up. You know, like I feel like. That reverence is Every almost. teenager that's ever bought a guitar has a Jimi Hendrix poster on their wall. You know what I'm saying? But I feel yeah. like I grew up loving rap music for all its complications, and there's lots of them, right? And I feel like rap music is not accepted into the notion of what good music is, what classic music is. You know, they're studied in universities these days, but sure. You um, say, I do agree with you, you say 100%. That, right? like, but like, for example, you, no, I, I, Ninth Wonder, I Ninth Wonder is giving like talks at like Harvard and all, as you said, it's a university level course. Now, mm-hmm. right? So I'm saying, even in that, like people get so excited. Oh, Black Thought from the Roots. He's so amazing. He did a thing. Like, you know, so I'm saying there's people, but again, that feeds into, for me, that whole Motown thing. And 
I'm I'm too small to rail against the whole idea of it. it what what do you mean by that whole Motown thing? Because you don't actually say exactly what you mean by that. Like people believe that Motown music is on the same. Can I give you an example? Let me say this: Stevie Wonder is as revered as Eric Clapton is. All right, sure. you agree with that? Probably, yeah. But a big part of that is because he's as commercially successful as he is, and a big part of his commercial success is songs like "I Just Called to Say I Love You." Not talking book. You can't go ask anybody, tell me your favorite song off talking book. They're not going to know what you say. But if you say Stevie Wonder, go, oh, yes, I just called to say I love you, guy. You know? Yeah, well, that's like, sense. Okay, I get you. So that's the. So these people's the whole careers are boiled down and reduced to a song or two. Whereas. And it's also to an audience that's not necessarily like the commercial audience is the white audience, essentially, yes. to a large degree. All right. And like white in terms of capital w white like it's yeah but right so you get into where i'm coming to now right i'm saying i love stevie wonder and like my daughters are in school getting taught about stevie wonder and that makes me happy but like even the songs that you all pick that you think is stevie wonder is i don't know like if you like stevie wonder it's not those songs man you know and i feel like there's been a <laughs> there's been a lot of that with rap music as well oh uh, well steve lacy like not necessarily rap music but he's going through that exact thing because of TikTok and like dealing with wide audiences and like just like having kids sing along just to the verse that is on TikTok and not knowing the rest of the song. All right. Now I'm saying every now and again, they'll attach themselves to a person like Kendrick and just go to pump a butterfly is so deep and you don't understand it. And I'm like, no, I've listened to a hundred albums like to pump a butterfly. You just heard this <laughs> one and decided, yo, this is the one now. And oh, you guys, you know, <laughs> yeah. It was made a million in a million different bedrooms like around the world. Because you were in college when J. Cole's album came out. Now J. Cole is J. Cole is deified. But you have okay. So without getting too fired <laughs> up about it and cutting into my content for, for my podcast, all I'm trying to do is shine a light on some of the other music that may not be as prominently represented in today's time and just introduce it to people. Because I care about it. But what's the hook on this? Because the actual, like, you, so we, we've been, like, I don't know, I've been interrupting you because, you know, that's how conversations go. I'm, like, I'm fine with that. But you've got a pretty interesting angle yes. uh, to this project that you're doing. So tell us that. So My son. It's a musical history project about rap music. That I started making for my son, my youngest son, because he all of a sudden is into, like, massively into, like, gorillas and nirvana and which is rad gorillas is in the rap music history i'm not arguing with that but when he like when he, we, we have these conversations and he says to me oh have you heard this acdc song i'm like oh man like what the fuck mm -hmm. like fine i've got nothing against acdc but even me i'm just like I, I need to give you give him some rock music bro <laughs> right so that's what i did i was like i'm still making this playlist i'm gonna put this lighty on just to listen to some of this this is some of what i lived through and yeah, that's it. That's all it is. That's the whole project. And I don't want to go too much into it because I want people to go click on it and just come along with me and see if it's your kind of thing. Well, I, yeah, like I took a little while to actually listen to it because like I don't have Spotify downloaded or anything. And because of the way you've done it, because you include music throughout it and you utilize mm -hmm. like the new functionality with Spotify to mm -hmm. do this. I love you that much that I downloaded Spotify on my phone and I listened to it and I was just like, this is such a cool fucking way to like tell, you know, a story about music. Yeah. That, that's all it is, bro. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just happy that it resonated like that with you and I, I want other people to come to it. As many people as possible. But at the same time, I'm not even like, I don't know what I'm trying to do with it. It's just so personal. Like it's inward. You, you get what I'm saying? And I hope that came So what across. is it called? It's Where can cool. people find it? Because we're going to be releasing it on the Almost Perfect Network, I guess. <laughs> on the network. Yeah. So it's on Spotify only. The thing I've been trying to do for ages, <laughs> but like, yeah, like you're actually just like <laughs> making it happen. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving me the roster spot there. But yeah, it's called uh, Educating Cade, a rap retrospective. It's available only on Spotify. I'm sure my, my, my homie, and my net, my label mate here is gonna put a link in the description as well for this when you listen to this to so go click on it there and yeah 
come, definitely come come listen and i won't get too much into it now because it, it kind of explains itself as it goes along but i'm very passionate about it and also i can't explain too much because i have to run now to go be a receptionist slash security guard slash yeah i've been looking at Andy the man. time yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's why we were like, oh shit, we're at an hour. Let's quickly plug the project that we're like we doing the whole thing for. Uh, but okay. cool, dude. Like, it's been fucking great chatting to you. Like, we've been sending voice notes, but it's yeah. actually been great to actually have another conversation with you and to hear how all of this has actually been going and like where you're at. And yeah, we we were always going to chat. We have podcasts always, like in the WhatsApps. Like, <laughs> if real people don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, th- and thank you again for having me on for a second time, bro. Like, it really, really means a lot to me. And oh, dude, like, I want you to be, like, you know, the the most, like, they have the most guest spots on this podcast. So, we're going to be chatting a lot. <laughs> yeah, live from the Winston alumni. <laughs> exactly. You know, exactly, dude. Like, this is, this is, yeah, everything's born from that to some degree. I'm a shot, cuz let me run away. Let me go put my work pants on, clip my keys on my belt, and do the things. And thank you to all the. Yeah, get your super on. Almost perfect listeners. And yeah, I, I know I'm saying you perfect are a listener. superman. <laughs> <laughs> Look after yourself, B. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay, you too, bye. brother. I love you, bro. I love you, man. <laughs> job, bye. So that was Neil. Uh, you probably you probably knew Neil a little bit before that conversation. We've done tons of stuff together. We did like strongly disagree. We did the fucking live from the Winston podcast. We've done hundreds of fucking comedy gigs together. He's been on this podcast. He's been on almost live, and he is one of my best friends and someone who I absolutely love getting to talk to. So I'm I'm stoked to you got to hear that. You got to hear what one of our conversations tends to go like because. Yeah, that's somewhat how they go. There's also a lot of stuff that we talk about that definitely will never be uh, for public consumption. But yeah, we'll put a link to his new podcast in the description and we are going to be releasing it through the Almost Perfect Network, which basically just means I'll be putting it on the website and sharing it through the socials as well. So you can check that out. It's a fucking sick project. I really, yeah, I'm, I'm hella impressed. So check that out how you living yo you're good i hope you're good i don't know things are chaotic like elon musk actually bought twitter because he had to and i don't i don't know anymore I don't, like i just i'm past giving a fuck man like i just whatever like we are in the age of decline like this is it this is i mean not just because of elon musk buying twitter you know it's all the other stuff as well but it is like I don't know, like, Rome's burning, people. Get your fiddles out. Like, that's... <laughs> yeah, I don't know, maybe maybe not so much, because as I always say, like, I look out the window, or I chill here, and like, yeah, life's not too shabby. Not, not for me, at least. Uh, I don't know how things are living for you. I hope, uh, hope within your personal life, things are looking up as, you know, the fucking... Ice caps melt. That's very much just become like my personal philosophy. Just try and find as many small moments of joy before it all goes to hell. Like, enjoy the good times. Because uh, who knows how much longer they will be good for. Which is, you know, kind of just a good life motto to have anyway. And I'm still doing the whole fucking mostly vegetarian thing. I carry my own bags to the fucking shops. I do all the small little things, well not all of them, but a lot of the small little things that, you know, we're individually meant to do, but that also feels kind of useless when, you know, the US military are bigger polluters than most countries. So, not really sure how I'm meant to counteract that. But yeah, on a small scale, you know, in, in the meter vicinity of uh, my life, things have been pretty decent. They've been pretty decent. Like, we had a great fucking time going to Origins Halloween party. Like, I'm not a huge fan of some of the DJing. Like, there was someone played early and I was just like, Dog, do you not understand the concept of the fucking opening DJ? Do you not understand building? And not. You know, you don't need to come with the big thump, thump, thump shit like in the beginning of the night. You know, we, we start with some groove. We get people moving, you know, steadily. And we build up to it. But, uh... <laughs> Yeah, that's 
that wasn't the thing but they're fucking i have to shout out like that's the thing you can have your issues with them for various things i don't always enjoy the djs and obviously the crowd's pretty young most of the time because well it's a fucking nightclub but yeah they really do like commit when it comes to their halloween party they've got like this whole fucking sick maze they pay but like i've done it before where i've been someone in the walls where i stick my hand out and scare people and shit and yeah, they pay a bunch of different people to dress up as like fucking zombies and create swamp creatures. And they even created like this literally like water raining down on you, like through the jungle over a rickety bridge like thing out in the fucking like parking lot <laughs> area, basically. It's really impressive. Like they really do go all out. And if you do have the opportunity to go to like Origins Halloween party at least once, I do recommend it. I think the club is fucking great. Like they've always invested in the sound and the design and everything like that. And they, yeah, like I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed myself on Friday nights leading into Saturday morning and just got to have a great night out. Uh, Paige dressed up as Trinity from the Matrix and she looked hot as fuck. And yeah, it was just was cool man it was just it was a good time so the good times keep a rolling at the moment for bobby p and like i say we will see you if you've, if you've listened to his podcast for long enough you know that's not always been the case especially not in the last couple of years and i really am just trying my best to enjoy life and make the most of it and keep just pushing towards the things that i want to do and create and be a part of and yeah connect with the people i want to connect with and i i hope you hope you do the same yo so that's that's it that's uh that's all i gotta say to you which means it's time to do the shout outs because of at patreon.com forward slash almost perfect there is a tier it is a touch of the titles tier and it's a top tier it is a ten dollar tier and you get to pick your title right here on the podcast so shout out to Rousseau, the storage clerk of subtle heresies in the Lesser Oberberg region. Russell Grant, the Far East correspondent. Neil Green, our key grip and our guest for the week. Karan Slemon, the almost perfect hedge fund manager. Vishendra Naidu, the spiritual advisor. Riz Ventura, the director of purchasing. Julian, our king. Karan Chetty, the assistant to the regional manager. Kat Jenkin, the inevitable ruler of the universe and Queen Swifty. Stephen Olafia, our executive producer, and our benefactor, who is anonymous. A big shout out to you for listening all the way through to this part, which wasn't quite the end. A big thank you to Damien Root for the delicious bed music you hear underneath and the absolutely fucking rocking uh, theme song you hear each and every single week. As always, I will catch you on the flip side.